Hello, I'd like to welcome the two amazing presenters we have speaking to you from New Zealand today. Um, they're going to be talking to us about midwifery care during natural disasters. Um, I'd like the first speaker um, presenting is going to be Claire McDonald, and Claire is a midwifery advisor at the New Zealand College of Midwives with portfolios in research, public health, and equity. Claire has a broad experience as a practicing midwife across many settings, including community, hospital, urban, and rural. When the Canterbury earthquakes hit in 2010-2011, Claire was a lead maternity care and midwife providing care in Christchurch, and the upheaval of this time highlighted the value and flexibility of midwife-led model of maternity care in an emergency situation. Claire has been interested in midwifery care during emergencies since that time and led the College of Midwives' response to the COVID-19 pandemic. She supported the Hawke's Bay midwives from afar in the College's national office during Cyclone Gabrielle in 2023. Lynn Lee Taylor also currently works in New Zealand and she is an independent caseloading midwife with experience in home birth, rural, birthing unit, secondary care and developing nation humanitarian aid. Lynn Lee has a varied background. Initially she worked as a registered nurse in the special care baby unit, then had a change of direction working in project management and later as the primary recovery handler for an international English maritime law consultancy firm. Wanting to get back to working within her own community and making a valuable contribution to women and their families, she completed a Bachelor of Midwifery. Lindley has a passion for advocacy, empowerment, and being part of creating a positive overall maternity experience for her clients and for the community. As the sub-regional chairperson for New Zealand College of Midwives, she held a lead role in setting up and coordinating a makeshift birthing unit and arranging midwives to staff this during the sudden and devastating February 2023 Cyclone Gabrielle. Lindley has recently returned from Sierra Leone, West Africa, after working as a humanitarian aid midwife for Doctors Without Borders and now continues her independent midwifery practice under the continuity of care model in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. So welcome to Claire and Lindley. Over to you. Oh, kia ora, Linda and kia ora tēnā koutou. Greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand. As Linda said, I'm Claire MacDonald and I live in Christchurch which is in the Canterbury region of New Zealand. Uh, and it's going to be my pleasure to talk with you about the experiences that we had uh, 14 and 13 years ago uh, of earthquakes uh, in there, in their numerous amount. Um, so we're going to talk about our experiences of midwifery care during natural disasters and the lessons learned for tomorrow's world. I'll be covering the New Zealand model of maternity care and the Canterbury earthquakes of 2010 and 2011. Lindley will talk about Cyclone Gabrielle last year. We'll cover the effects on midwives, women and people, babies and families, and consider the lessons learned, because with climate change, these will not be the last emergencies we experience. There are over 3,000 midwives who hold an annual practicing certificate in New Zealand. These midwives provide care to, on average, 60,000 families a year. Midwives can choose to work in the community or in maternity facilities. Most primary maternity care is provided by lead maternity carers who take responsibility for the care provided to women throughout pregnancy, labour and birth and up to six weeks following birth. They work in a caseloading continuity of care model. They're self-employed and publicly funded, claiming under the primary maternity services model notice. I'll refer to them variously as lead maternity carers, LMCs or community midwives in this presentation. The maternity service in New Zealand is an integrated system of primary, secondary and tertiary care. Midwife-led continuity of care is the cornerstone of the New Zealand maternity service. When a woman or person needs medical services, like an obstetrician or if their baby needs a paediatrician, they work in collaboration together with the midwife, so the woman and the family experience a seamless maternity service that meets their individual needs. Women and people can choose to birth at home, in a primary maternity facility or birthing centre, or in a secondary or tertiary maternity hospital with their LNC midwife in attendance. 
14 years ago, life as we knew it in Canterbury changed suddenly. Between September 2010 and the end of 2011, four major earthquakes and more than 11,200 aftershocks shook the residents of Christchurch and surrounding towns. This graphic illustrates the magnitudes and timeframes of the earthquake series. We all became armchair seismologists, sharing our guesses of the magnitude, depth and distance of the epicentre of any given shake. It all began at 4.35am on Saturday the 4th of September 2010. And you can see the clock stopped at one of our theatres in Christchurch at that time. I was awoken by a violent shaking as the region was rocked with a 7.1 magnitude earthquake. All over the region, masonry was falling, kitchen cupboards were emptying themselves onto the floor, and parents were running to their children. A phenomenon known as liquefaction brought silt and surface flooding to much of the city. Some people lost their homes, but we were lucky at that time that nobody lost their lives. Then, five and a half months later, in the middle of a busy weekday at 12.51pm on Tuesday the 22nd of February 2011, another big one struck. A 6.3 magnitude earthquake shook Christchurch city, with dust from the falling buildings in the central city visible from the hills. This time, 185 people tragically lost their lives, and I would like to acknowledge the family and friends who lost loved ones at that time. Many more people were injured. In Christchurch, at the time of the earthquakes, midwives continued to provide care in the women and families' homes, in their clinics or in hospitals. Most women were still able to contact their midwife by cell phone or text. This meant midwives negotiated damaged roads, liquefaction and numerous diversions. It was particularly difficult on the east side of town where many bridges were damaged or closed. City council staff on the roadworks must have been used to midwives asking, is there any chance I can get over that bridge? I need to visit a mum and a new baby on the other side. Community midwives had to be especially aware of practical issues that suddenly became more difficult. This included making sure they knew where petrol stations were open and ensuring that their mobile phones were charged. For community midwives, who often feel their car is their office, this was particularly the case following the earthquakes. Midwives were often visiting houses where women had no power or running water. Hand sanitizer became a permanent fixture in midwives' equipment and cars. For some families, the midwife visiting them at home was the first official person they saw since the earthquakes. Midwives offering home birth worked out individual plans with those families. For some women, lack of power or water and the difficulties of negotiating damaged roads, if transfer was required, meant that they decided to birth in hospital or one of our birthing units instead. Community midwives continued to provide care to women who came into Christchurch Women's Hospital in labour and no women who arrived in the birthing suite came without their community midwife. Throughout the earthquakes, midwives in Christchurch Women's Hospital, our tertiary maternity facility, continued to provide services as usual for women and their families. As in other areas of the hospital, staff were committed to coming to work despite their own families and homes being affected by the earthquake. So in the top left, you can see our main hospital and at the bottom left is Lincoln Maternity Unit, which at the time was a primary maternity facility, midwife led unit that continued to run as well. In order to ensure that the service provided was unaffected, Birthing Suite had a list of midwives who had volunteered to help in the hospital if other staff needed to be at home with their families and were unable to get to work or if they needed to move house. Midwives already employed in the hospital and community-based LMC midwives also have offered to help as needed. Everybody pitched in. In reality though, this help was really required as staff continued to work and provide care for the women who needed it at that time. The collegial relationships built up over many years between the district staff and management, lead maternity carers and the New Zealand College of Midwives were integral to the maternity system continuing to function as normal. 
These relationships were also strengthened as midwives from all areas supported colleagues and women throughout the country at this stressful time. Staff were aware that many of the women and families they were dealing with were tired, stressed and anxious and this affected their responses to events in their pregnancy and labour. Women and their families were particularly anxious about other children that they had left at home. This also made it more essential that staff felt able to work and support those families at that time. These pictures show the regional and national College of Midwives leaders gathering to coordinate their support efforts. We have the regional chair people, the director of midwifery for the district health board, our college staff, and at the bottom in the right, a midwife with her client in practice with the shared maternity record that I will talk about in a moment. The College of Midwives National Office is in Christchurch and our building was irreparably damaged, so space was at a premium, hence everybody gathering and sitting on the floor. The chief executive of the time wrote about the College of Midwives response in our member magazine. The Canterbury region and the national office of the College of Midwives rallied, organised and supported members to carry on being midwives. The college worked with the district's emergency teams, hospital midwifery leaders, civil defence, the city council and the national disaster coordination in Wellington, the capital city, to ensure advice to midwives and families was appropriate and current. The ability to network and cooperate in this way was evidence of the social networks midwifery works within. For many women who were pregnant at the time of the earthquakes, the thought of birthing their baby in Christchurch with the ongoing aftershocks and issues with power and water was particularly daunting, as it was for families with new babies. Many women therefore chose to leave Christchurch with their families. In the days before electronic maternity records, which we have now, women carried their notes with them throughout their pregnancy and after the baby was born. The notes had duplicated pages so that at the end of a woman's care, the midwife keeps the original copy and the woman kept the book and had a complete record of her care. Following the earthquakes, this system was invaluable because if a woman left Christchurch, they were able to take their clinical record with them and had a full record of their care. This meant a midwife in any area could access this information, follow the woman's plans and continue to provide care in a seamless manner. The college's membership in other regions responded to the president's call to help find LMC midwives for those women leaving Christchurch. They took referrals and contacted the woman as soon as possible to be able to provide care in as seamless a way as possible once they arrived in the new region. Many other midwives around the country offered places and spaces as a place of respite for those midwives who'd lost their homes. Midwives were personally affected as residents of the city. Many experienced losses and were looking after their own families with the ongoing stresses of living in a damaged city. I personally didn't have any power or running water for two weeks and for some it was longer. The sewerage system was down for weeks and in some suburbs it was months. Portaloos, as you can see in the bottom right side, were established in, along residential streets and neighbours often got chatting for the first time around the shared toilets. Chemical toilets were eventually delivered, but a lot of families had to find ways of making do, and that included digging a hole in the garden. Water was scarce and we had to fill up containers from tanks that were placed in the community. And you'll see in that picture um, some of the devastation to some of the houses with a bedroom exposed by the broken wall, a car damaged. And in the bottom right there, those large piles are actually the piles of dried out liquefaction that people had got, grabbed their shovels and gone and moved into spaces between the driveways so people could at least get in and out of their properties. But unfortunately, that muck also went through many people's homes and those homes were no longer livable. And yet... Midwives carried on through, turning up to the hospital for shifts, coordinating with their group practice partners to see women who lived in their neighbourhoods and supporting pregnant, birthing and postpartum women. So I've shared some of the lessons throughout this talk and here's a bit of a summary. Life can change very quickly and unexpectedly in the event of a disaster. 
the infrastructure we take for granted is severely compromised, and that includes roads, water, sanitation, and communications. But our integrated community and hospital maternity system was resilient despite the incredible stress placed on the health system. The caseloading LMC care model enabled community midwives to self-organize within their practices to continue providing care, while most other community-based health services, they stopped. The College of Midwives National Network enabled coordination, sorry, communications to be coordinated for the profession and support to be quickly mobilized around the country. In future, what we said was that midwifery and maternity care need to be formally integrated into national emergency planning. So I'd like to thank you for taking time to listen to this part of the talk about midwifery care and emergencies in New Zealand. And I'll now hand over to Lindley to talk about last year's cyclone. First of all, though, I'd like to acknowledge those who contributed to the content that I've presented today. That was Rose Barker, Samantha Burke and Margaret Kyle and also the New Zealand College of Midwives Photo Archive. Over to you, Lindley. Thank you, Claire. I'm Lindley Taylor, a self-employed lead maternity carer, or LMC as Claire said. And as explained, this means a case-loading midwife with my own client list, where I take the lead role for that woman's care from conception through to six weeks postnatal. Today I'll be sharing with you the devastating event of Cyclone Gabriel, specifically discussing how it impacted Hawke's Bay, I'm really mindful and I want to acknowledge there were other areas in New Zealand that this cyclone impacted as well, but for this presentation, I will be focusing on Hawke's Bay. It's where I live and work. I will then discuss what we did as midwives specifically and the lessons we learnt and finally what we're working on today. On the map here is the Hawke's Bay region. It's highlighted in red, and you can see that we're in the North Island of New Zealand, where I was born and raised and have a large family network. The evening of the 13th of February arrived, and I went to bed after filling up my car with petrol, plugging in my phone and laptop to charge, filled up a large pot with water, a few of them, and I had spoken with my young adult kids about being prepared. What happened over the course of the next day on February the 14th and the days going forward was utterly devastating for parts of Hawke's Bay, enlarged due to massive amounts of water coming from the mountain ranges and busting riverbanks. 1,600 people needed emergency accommodation and 9,000 people were accommodated and fed. This slide is a small town called Fern Hill. It's 20 minutes from where I live, and it is 10 minutes from the nearest hospital. And this is from one of the busted riverbanks. This is another town called Wairoa, which has a large river running through the centre of that town. And again, the river burst its banks. There were 30 isolated communities. The amount of water in the rivers was extreme and devastating. In Hawke's Bay, it was utterly tragic to have confirmed loss of eight precious lives, whose ages ranged from two to 76. For all the areas the cyclone affected, there were a total of 11 people who died, and some of those were emergency responders. There also remains one person still classed as missing, he or his truck have never been found. The stories that have been told by surviving family are ones of deep grief, trauma and tragedy. Here you'll see one of the many homes completely engulfed with water and there were numerous rooftop rescues. More than 25 bridges were destroyed along with significant damage to railway lines. This is a picture of the silt that remained once all the floodwaters receded. It was everywhere. 1,200 homes eventually were recorded as significantly damaged. Our cell towers were damaged and our power station was damaged. This is Casey, the horse, and it's actually one of my colleague's daughter's horses. 
And that horse was in really poor condition and didn't make it, like many animals, over the next few days and weeks. What took us by surprise was the suddenness of it all. And that suddenness was the river stop banks failing, allowing massive amounts of water to start flooding the towns and the communities to an extreme extent. The weather was bad overnight, but while we were living in the communities and in the town, we didn't actually realise the extent of the rainfall in the ranges. Many didn't think in our modern country that the stock banks wouldn't actually be capable of doing their job. This pick is one of the many rescues on a rooftop. The waters continued to rise. Some were able to place emergency calls for extraction, and we now know that some of those calls didn't get answered due to the overwhelm on the emergency system. Some calls were answered, but no one was available to urgently rescue them. And I can't imagine the terror that those people would have felt. A number of local and non-emergency people used jet skis, boats, and even one local guy using his own helicopter to rescue families and foreign orchard workers. So although there were 400 official rescues, Many, many more life-saving rescues happened on the 14th of February. By lunchtime, it was clear that we were in a state of emergency. The power had gone out about 7.30 in the morning. For most, of it, there were no cell phone reception. So this now means no communication, no ability to access online information for emergency notices. And some sat in their cars to listen to the radio, Others had found their battery radios and tuned in to hear the slow bits of information coming in. There was a lot of fear, and it became clearer that some areas were experiencing the need for a significant number of extreme rescues. For Hawke's Bay, the main secondary care large hospital is located in Hastings, with a birthing unit attached to it. We now had a large number of isolated communities, so there were 30, and they're cut off from the main hospital, including the second largest city, Napier, which is only located about 15 or 20 minutes away. Bridges had collapsed, roads were washed away. There was extreme flooding on the expressway between the two main cities, and once the expressway water began to recede, remains of animal bodies, fruit from the orchards, and a large amount of debris were all over the expressway and needed to be cleaned up before we could use it again. Some midwives who worked at the hospital and live in the now isolated Napier City were not able to get to work. Some midwives who were working in Hastings at the time now were unable to get back home. And this went on for a number of days. We were well and truly in a state of disconnection. The midwives are spread throughout these towns and cities, and as a general rule, all urgent and labour communication from women to their midwife is via phone. The woman would call to arrange to meet, for example, at the hospital or at the woman's home or clinic, but we now don't have that ability. Many women now don't have the ability to access the hospital or the birthing unit as they're attached together. So we are left with a situation now, women can't communicate with their midwife, women can't access the hospital or the birthing unit, and the emergency response team, which included the army and civil offence, are facing absolute overwhelm, rescuing those in life-threatening situations. Then there is a maternity unit at the hospital where they are trying to work through their own emergency management plan, including organising staffing. So this is where the story gets a little bit more positive. I actually feel really proud to be a midwife, particularly when I reflect on this period of time where midwives quickly pulled together. It became so clear that midwives are resourceful. We have a huge amount of initiative. And I believe a word that certainly describes us is nimble. On the morning of the cyclone, I called through to the maternity unit at the hospital about 7am, asking if they needed any help. It was all okay at that point for staffing. When we spoke, we actually all didn't realise the extent of the devastation that was currently being unleashed. The power then went out a short while later. I called a few other self-employed midwives to check in, and only then did I realise 
that I could not get a hold of anyone on the phone. The maternity unit back at the hospital, I called the maternity unit back at the hospital and let them know that it seems like most LMC or the community midwife's phones were on blackout. So we've got a problem. I discovered another midwife was now down at the medical centre. That's a picture of her there, Julie. And that was only a few minutes away from my house. So I went down there and the plan was set. That midwife would stay overnight with our home birth kits. She would be able to use the internal landline to phone me as a backup. As strangely, I had full reception as long as I was sitting on my couch at home. The next morning I went down again and we decided the best use of my time was to use my fully charged laptop accessing the database that I hold with the names of it and addresses, use my car with that full tank of gas, and I went and door knocked on nearly every Napier midwife's door that was on our cut-off side. As I went to each midwife's home I could that I could access, checking in with them, and we also then, on the doorstep, planned together and made a shift roster for three days. Every midwife was more than willing to help in our newly commandeered, commandeered space at the medical centre. So I want to say at this point, no one had asked us to do this. It was more that we understood that there was no plan for any birthing woman or space for any specific maternity care outside of a helicopter rescue or at times potential for an ambulance transfer, depending on the flooding and the bridges to the hospital from our side of the region. All the while there were life-threatening emergency retrievals happening, we needed a Napier base so emergency resources were not used unnecessarily. There was no plan from the hospital for maternity outside of the hospital. We just did it. The Napier Medical Centre, where we based ourselves, were glad, relieved and even commented, we didn't think about maternity. Thank you so much for coming. From there on, we began the shift roster and the midwives who are a mix of hospital midwives who lived in Napier, unable to now travel to the hospital, and the LMC midwives, they all turned up like clockwork. We had an OB registrar who lived in Napier who presented, a postnatal nurse presented, and we also had a paediatrician available on our side. We now had our own fully staffed, albeit cut off, maternity birthing and triage unit. The instant collegiality was a real credit to our region. National New Zealand College of Midwives also directly engaged and helped assist arranging three local midwives to come and help with the short staffing at the hospital. And that's a picture of them there. As the reality hit, it was really clear. There was no previous shared plan in place for community midwives to know what to do when cut off from the hospital and no communications are available. Remembering it is the LMC community midwives who hold the bulk of the birthing woman. The medical centre we were working out of happened to have direct phone line access and a working computer connected directly in with the hospital along with generators for power. So we were able to send a list of drugs and equipment that were needed from the hospital, which the emergency staff brought over to us. All the while, for the general public, battery radio was the only source of the information. Lessons learnt. There are a few. We need a well-circulated plan for what to do and where to present as a midwife if there is a sudden emergency and no communications are able to be put out or accessed. The self-employed midwives who hold the bulk of all pregnant women need to be incorporated into any hospital-wide emergency plan who work directly with civil defence as well. And then plans wi shared widely among the self-employed midwives. The makeshift unit was set up by self-employed midwives who just decided off their own backs that there was a problem and turned up and made a temporary unit happen. It was fortuitous that I had the addresses of all the midwives and it was just good foresight to make sure I had a fully charged laptop. No one expected a blackout on cell reception or loss of power for many days. And in some, hour, uh, some areas, it went on for weeks. 
if you are if you are a more electronic type midwife, as in it's all in the cloud, how often do you print out basic information that you might need if there's a sudden loss of power or communication? It's something that I've certainly learned. Have a plan for you and your family to be ready for three days of no help, no water, no food, no power, no communications except hopefully radio. This is what is traditionally recommended. However, after this event, advisors are starting to now say be ready for seven days. Provide a standard and basic checklist to give to all women at booking about being prepared for an emergency and what things to put aside. When there's a newborn coming, they're much more likely to be receptive to being prepared. Be emotionally prepared for all presenting scenarios of pregnant people in your makeshift clinic. I say this is that, is that you may have many super anxious and well presenting and the clinically unwell. Expecting this mix, I think, is also a part of us being prepared. A lot of reassurance is often needed as well. I'd suggest people have increased anxiety when they don't know what the plan is. In Hawke's Bay, we're now working through streamlining some issues that were obvious with hindsight. When I say we, it has been a midwife, midwife initiative to approach the hospital and start working in with them. You may find that often maternity gets a bit forgotten or it is well down the list. We are working toward updating the hospital emergency disaster plan with consideration to self-employed midwives, along with an easy to access folder that can be in the hospital maternity area. So whoever is there at the time is able to use this, including a standard list of emergency equipment and drugs to pack to be ready to take to any cutoff area via the emergency responders or civil defence. We are updating with consent all the self-employed midwife's addresses with the hospital emergency coordinator, and we are working on information, a pamphlet that can become mainstream for all midwives to share with women about how to be prepared and where to go if needing help when there is no phone or communication. I think a natural disaster is a matter of when, not if. So let's think about how best to be prepared. So in summary, really it's what is on the screen. Do you know your practice best? What are your weak links? It can happen suddenly and quickly. We certainly saw that. Plan for three days at a minimum. How will you communicate with your clients and colleagues? And do you have an emergency plan? Because there's usually no time at the time. Thank you very much.